Hi, this is Richard Dwyer. It is Monday, October 5th, 2020. Let's focus in on Dr. Jeffrey McDonald's claim that Helena Stokely was present the night of his family's murder. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, many of you have left messages about Helena Stokely. I just watched season one, episode 11 of the ID series called People Magazine Presents, right? And it's on the McDonald murder and it's presented from the defense's point of view. Now let's go back to the night of the murder. Understand, as I mentioned in a prior video, one of the first responding military investigators is in the car, the passenger seat, on the way to the McDonald household. Understand, Jeffrey McDonald call the police, right? McDonald needed an ambulance. They're headed over to his house. This early 20 military investigator who shows up in person for the FX series Wilderness of Era. He's in the first episode, folks. He looks over. It's a rainy day. He sees a blonde woman wearing a floppy hat, standing under an awning. Now he knew Helena Stokely. He said definitively back in 1970, when these murders took place, that the woman he saw was not Helena Stokely. He says definitively on the FX show, A Wilderness of Era, that the woman he saw was not Helena Stokely. This is someone else, right, who's wearing a floppy hat and who has on a blonde wig or is blonde herself. By the way, folks, just food for thought on where McDonald gets the floppy hat from. Maybe he saw this woman on his way home. Maybe he knew that his own wife, Colette McDonald, had a floppy hat, right? I don't believe the woman with the floppy hat existed at the McDonald household. But understand, the only spotting of a woman with a floppy hat by the McDonald household or within range of the McDonald household is this military investigator who knew Helena Stokely and who told authorities at the time that the woman he saw was not Helena Stokely. Let me also point out something significant. None of Helena Stokely's fingerprints, none of them, are present in the McDonald household. None of them. So understand, no investigator saw Helena Stokely that night. It might surprise you further to know that the police knew Helena Stokely because after all, she was a police informant for Fayetteville detective Prince Beasley. Right, Beasley claims or claimed before his death Right before he left the police squad, in part because he was found passed out behind the wheel of his car. May have had a drinking problem. Well, understand, Beasley claims that Helena Stokely had been giving him reliable information on her friends. Helena Stokely had turned in many of her friends to police. Right, Stokely is 18 years old. This is a teenager, folks. 
and she's a police informant she's a snitch as we use in today's vocabulary so the police didn't have to guess who Helena Stokely was they knew her now understand <clears throat> No one sees Helena Stokely the night of the murders around the McDonald household. Well, the day after the murders, Detective Prince Beasley meets up with Stokely. And the only thing Stokely could give him were the addresses of several hippies some of her friends who matched the descriptions of the alleged wrongdoers, the alleged murderers. She doesn't say to Prince Beasley, I was there. Nothing like that. She doesn't say, I know these people did the crime. Nothing like that. Rather, she hears about two white guys one black guy a girl in a floppy hat and she just tells the police you know what that matches the description of this friend of that friend of this person right what she doesn't say to Beasley is I was involved in this crime there is nothing like that you're hearing about confessions folks they did not happen when the police talked with Stokely the day after the murder. Did not happen. By the way, let's dive a little bit deeper into Stokely. You should know that Stokely is hospitalized some period after the murder, right? A few weeks after the murder, she's hospitalized because Stokely's a very heavy drug user. Very heavy. And when she comes out of the hospital, she moves to Nashville, where she becomes a police informant. In other words, Stokely is someone accustomed to cooperating with the police. According to Prince Beasley, the information she gave the police was very helpful in helping the police apprehend other people. So the question begs itself. Who's the person who links Stokely to this crime? Who's the first person to say, hey, I have evidence that Stokely may have been involved in this crime? Now here's where things get a little murky. Understand the crime was very high profile. It happened six months after the Manson murders. Right? It's all over the news. Apparently at one point, Freddie Kassab, Colette McDonald's father-in-law, stepfather, offered a reward for news that would lead to the apprehension and conviction of the murderers. Right? Kassab early on believed in Jeffrey McDonald's story. Right? He said that, look, if he had another daughter, he would want her to marry Jeffrey McDonald. So, enter 22-year-old William Posey. Now keep in mind, by this time, Detective Prince Beasley had already interviewed Helena Stokely. Right? The cop who saw a blonde woman wearing a floppy hat by the scene of the crime or within driving range of the scene of the crime on the Fort Bragg base knew Helena Stokely and knew that this woman was not her. So, of course, we get William Posey, 22. Maybe he heard about the $5,000 reward, which was big money in 1970 being offered by Freddie Kassab. So, of course, he claimed that during a trip to the bathroom 
at four in the morning, he saw a Mustang pull in next door. He knew his next door neighbor is a woman named Helen. And supposedly Helen hops out the car. There's some other people in the car, right? People who might have matched the descriptions of the people who were allegedly in Jeffrey McDonald's house. And of course, when Helen gets out the car, Helen turns out to be Helena Stokely. This is the morning of the murders. She's wearing a light colored floppy hat and a blonde wig. So of course, Posey claims that later he speaks with Helen, right? He's unaware of her actual name. They start talking about the murders. Again, it was all over the news. And Helen tells him that she was so drugged out on mescaline and acid that night that she can't remember that night. She can't remember anything she did that night. So, Posey contacts the police. He feels that his neighbor, who he saw at four in the morning that night, get out of a Mustang wearing a light-colored floppy hat, might be the woman who Jeffrey McDonald described to the police. Well, here's the problem, folks, and it's a big problem. It's one that isn't mentioned enough. The police then gave 22-year-old William Posey a lie detector test. Why isn't this front and center on every Jeffrey McDonald show? Because after all, it's William Posey who links Helena Stokely to what happened at the McDonald house. Even though he wasn't there, didn't see her there. Right, he's the witness who can tell us that on the night of the murder, she's wearing a light colored floppy hat. Folks, there's no one else. Well, he flunks the lie detector test. Then he admits that he wasn't sure that he saw Stokely that night. He also says that he may have glimpsed the Mustang in a dream. Folks, William Posey is unreliable. The lie detector test does not support the story he gave police when he first contacted them. Dare I say, given the absence of forensics, right? No, and I mean no, fingerprints of Helena Stokely in the house. Understand, she's supposed to be holding a candle. There's no sign of a candle having been burning in the house. The police get there fast. They don't smell a candle that just burned. There's no wax anywhere. Helena Stokely apparently didn't touch anything. Jeffrey McDonald didn't get a good look at Helena Stokely. If it was her, why do we believe it's Helena Stokely and not the blonde woman who wasn't Helena Stokely, who a military investigator saw closer to the house, the apartment that night? Dare I say, there is no evidence tying Helena Stokely to these murders. We don't even know, quite frankly, if Helena Stokely had on a blonde wig with a floppy hat that night. Because the person who allegedly saw her wearing the floppy hat failed a lie detector test and then admitted that he wasn't sure well, let's go one step further. 
Did you know that a military representative, an investigator, William Ivory, followed up after William Posey discredited himself, investigator William Ivory followed up with Helena Stokely. Right, the military had somebody talk with Helena Stokely. Right, this is after a Fayetteville detective. Prince Beasley had spoken with Stokely days earlier. A military investigator speaks with Stokely. This, by the way, is years before the McDonald trial, where Stokely at the trial says she doesn't remember. Of course, when Stokely's under oath. Well, here with the military investigator, this is in 1970, folks. Stokely tells the investigator that she had not been inside McDonald's apartment. She didn't know the address. Right, Stokely isn't putting herself in the McDonald apartment. Understand, given the absence of forensics, given the absence of any witness who saw Stokely around McDonald's apartment, given the unreliability of her neighbor, William Posey, the police would need a confession from Stokely a real confession to implicate her in this crime. Even if they got a confession, they would need to ask themselves why it's raining outside and yet there are no muddy footprints in the house. Are we supposed to believe that these hippies are supposed to have entered the house. Understand, McDonald doesn't have anyone wearing gloves. These hippies are supposed to have entered the house and then been so well thought out that they would not leave footprints in the house, but of course they would toss the murder weapons that they found in the house. Right? Ice pick, bed slat, out the back door of the house. Well, let me say this too. Understand, there are two CID investigations. Would it shock you to learn that Jeffrey McDonald, during his marriage, understand, he meets Colette when they're young. They get pregnant after his sophomore year in college. During his relationship with Colette, McDonald had at least 15 girlfriends. Right now, folks, I just watched a show, that People Magazine show, where they say the McDonald marriage wasn't ideal. Folks, it wasn't close to ideal. Jeffrey McDonald was a philanderer. Full blown. Not one affair, several. Well, let me just say this. There's even a woman who told the CID that she was having sex with McDonnell while he was under investigation for the murder of his family. Let's get back to Helena Stokely. When Helena Stokely, after she got hospitalized, weeks after the McDonald murders, right? She got discharged. Now, what I'm going to do is to read from a Vanity Fair article that quotes the psychiatrist's discharge form. Right? It says here, the prognosis for this patient seems poor. Beyond taking heroin eight or nine times a day, 
along with a grab bag of barbiturates, stimulants, and psychedelics. Stokely was a schizoid personality. Right, you're talking about a deeply troubled teenager who is on her way to dying of sclerosis of the liver by the time she's in her early 30s. She's deeply troubled. But what I want people to remember is she cooperates with the police. She speaks with Prince Beasley. I haven't read anything to suggest that she had an attorney present. Even though the crime she was accused of participating in is as terrible as it gets. The murder of a pregnant woman and her fetus. The murder of the McDonald's young children. That's four murders. She doesn't have an attorney when she talks with Prince Beasley. There's no record of her having an attorney when she talks with William Ivory, the military investigator. She's cooperating with police. Then she checks herself into a hospital, right? Apparently the drug use, and it's massive, had caught up with her. Then she moves to Nashville where she becomes a police informant there. That's the individual that Jeffrey McDonald is hanging his defense on. Someone who no one saw on the night of the murders anywhere close to McDonald's apartment. Well, let me say this. After McDonald moves to California, right, he gets an honorable discharge from the Army Right? The Army investigation falls flat. The best argument his attorney comes up with is the fact that the crime scene was tampered with by police. There are different photos of different things in different positions. Right, Although, no one can explain why the cards in the living room that were on the counter were supposedly McDonald's fought valiantly with three men, right? You might remember all the holes in his pajama top, which these three men are supposed to have caused by, you know, wielding an ice pick at him in the room that knocks over the table in the room, right? We are to believe that that commotion wasn't enough to knock over the cards birthday cards and stuff like that on the counter in the living room. Well, understand, after McDonald moves to California, Stokely is working with McDonald representatives. Right? They understand that there's still an effort to hold McDonald accountable for the murder of his family. So, so Stokely, at that point, signs a statement implicating herself and some friends of hers in the murder. Now understand, she was married at the time to a guy named Ernie Davis. And Ernie Davis said, she knew it was all lies. But she said if she didn't tell them what they wanted to hear, they'd bother her even more. Now, here's where, for me, it gets a little disturbing. We keep hearing that Helena Stokely was involved without any real evidence of her involvement. But we never hear about the people that she implicated in the murders. Right, the McDonald defense team doesn't say Helena Stokely and Kathy Perry, a second woman, right, who Helena Stokely claims was involved, as well as the other people Helena Stokely says was involved 
Alan Mazzaro. Well, here's why we don't hear about these names. They never show up on any of these shows. Have you noticed? No one talks about the Helena Stokely confession details that contradict not just Jeffrey McDonald's version of events, but the evidence itself. So, Kathy Perry, according to Vanity Fair, and I'll put a link to the Vanity Fair article in the comment section of this YouTube video. It says here, McDonald's only solace was that Helena Stokely's supposed cohort, Kathy Perry, had confessed. Right? McDonald implicates Kathy Perry, who then says what happened. Her story was less than airtight. Among other things, it had the intruder subduing McDonald with the injection of a narcotic. The problem, of course, is that none was found in his body. Let's remember, McDonald is taken from the murder scene to the hospital. They know he had no narcotics in his system. He's on uppers, folks, not narcotics. And the reason he's on uppers, according to him, was because he was trying to lose weight for a boxing competition. Of course, McDonald had worked an inordinate amount of hours. And there were many people who believe that it's the uppers that led to the rage that enveloped McDonald as he killed his family. Also, uh, Kathy Perry talked about going upstairs in the McDonald household. Unfortunately for McDonald, the apartment did not have a second floor. Right? Then, of course, Kathy Perry talks about beating one of the two boys. Doing so herself. Here's the problem. McDonald had two girls. They weren't boys. Right? Then, of course, Perry claimed that she killed Colette by stabbing her stomach and legs. The problem, of course, is that Colette did not have stab wounds to her legs. Right? So just understand, Kathy Perry was a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. If you believe Helena Stokely was involved in this murder and that her confession is credible, let's look at the confession. Does the part involving Kathy Perry remotely sound reliable to you? Right, it's not enough to hear that Helena Stokely confessed to several people. There's a bigger question here. Well, what did her confession say? Folks, we, we know her confessions were unreliable. She also claimed that Alan Mazzaro was there. Well, just understand, folks, records show that Mazzaro was in jail on charges of possessing 1,000 doses of LSD. So, an investigator for the McDonald team, a guy named Brian Murtaugh, figured out that there were alibis for most of the people identified by Helena Stokely in her alleged confessions. Right, folks, they weren't there. The confessions were false. Right? We come to find out, by the way, that Prince Beasley was trying to get a movie deal. He talked with some Hollywood types. Well, 
It might surprise you to learn that he also talked with Helena Stokely, mentioned to her that she could participate in the earnings from the movie. So much like Helena Stokely's neighbor might have been enticed to give a false statement to the police by Freddie Kassab's $5,000 reward for information on who did the murders, Helena Stokely might have been enticed to come up with confessions involving people like Kathy Perry who, of course, know nothing about the murder scene, can't even tell you the gender of McDonald's children, is so confused by the layout of the apartment that she claimed that she was upstairs in the apartment. Let me also say this. The McDonald team, late in the game, started talking about a blonde hair found on Colette's hairbrush made of saran. It's a single strand. Right? The argument is that this saran strand of hair must have come from the blonde wig worn by the mysterious woman in the floppy hat that night. Well, just understand that saran is great for doll hair. And let's be clear, the McDonald's had two young children who might have played with dolls. Saran is fine for doll hair, not for human wigs. So, as a government attorney diplomatically put it, unless the defendant wants to maintain that Ken and Barbie did it, I don't see how this hair helps them very much. Nor do I. Elena Stokely isn't a credible suspect, folks. There's no one who saw her near Jeffrey McDonald's apartment that night. The individual who contacted the police about her, her neighbor, failed a lie detector test later confessed that he may have thought about a Mustang in a dream he had. The only reason Helena Stokely, who the day after the murder, speaks with a Fayetteville detective, then later speaks with a military investigator, right, cooperates with the police, gets hospitalized, moves to Nashville, becomes a police informant there. The only reason she's of interest is because she was a drugged out teenager who, when told about the possibility of a movie deal, when she realized that this murder was a high publicity event, a lot of people knew about it. It was on the national news. May have wanted attention started saying things that the McDonald defense wanted to hear. Started talking about doing the crime with friends who were not there. Had no idea about the interior of Jeffrey McDonald's apartment. Let's go one step further. If Helena Stokely's friends were messed up, right, can't remember the night with any specificity. Maybe they, like Helena Stokely, had taken mescaline that night. Then how could they have pulled off this quadruple homicide, leaving really no forensic evidence, right? No footprints, no evidence. There's blood in the apartment and it matches the McDonald family. Right? People are wielding things like ice picks. There's a violent struggle with Colette. But yet there's no blood. 
in the McDonald household from any of the people identified by Helena Stokely or from Helena Stokely herself. Let me also wave a red cup on People magazine. Understand that not only are fibers from Jeffrey McDonald's pajama top found under Colette's body, which discredits his story, but there are portions of a surgical glove found by Colette. People, use, people believe that the killer put on that surgical glove to write pig on the headboard of the bed. Unless you believe that these disorganized hippies, right? Helena Stokely can't even remember that night. These disorganized hippies showed up at the McDonald apartment with surgical gloves which McDonald never mentions, or that these hippies, none of whom are ever supposed to have been in the McDonald apartment, knew where to look in the McDonald apartment, right, under the kitchen sink, off at the side. That's where Dr. McDonald kept his surgical gloves. Unless you believe that the hippies were organized enough to have surgical gloves or knew where they were in McDonald's apartment and somehow decided to use it, then McDonald is the person who did this crime. He would be the person who knew where the surgical gloves were. Let me say this too. The recreation on ID's People magazine show is off. It has McDonald wearing his pajama top. The three guys come at him with an ice pick. They show McDonald getting stabbed with the ice pick. He's trying to fend it off. You wonder how he could be alive after that. But understand, that's not what happened. McDonald takes off the pajama top by McDonald's own admission. The pajama top is wrapped around his wrists. He supposedly is blocking the shots. This is out of a Bruce Lee movie. He's blocking the shots with the pajama top wrapped around his wrists. Given the fabric of that pajama top, that pajama top would have shredded. Let me say this too. The People magazine recreation is so bad. They make it sound like the police are over there wondering what happened, or rather military investigators on the Fort Bragg base are over there wondering what happened, and then they happen to see the Esquire magazine right on the floor because the table's been knocked over. And they happen to notice that that Esquire magazine has an article on the Manson family. Well, folks, it's deeper than that. We know McDonald is looking at that Esquire magazine after the scene gets bloody. Because that Esquire magazine in the front room has a blood smudge on it. In other words, after people have bled, Jeffrey McDonald picks up that magazine. It's not happenstance. He's looking at the magazine after people have bled. So I'm sorry. I'm not buying Helena Stokely in the slightest. In the comment section of this video, I'm going to challenge the people who believe Jeffrey McDonald is innocent to explain in the comment section of this video how the blood smudge ended up on that Esquire magazine. Also, in the comment section of this video, please identify one person. It could be anyone who saw Helena Stokely within a mile of Jeffrey McDonald's apartment the night of the murders. 
right, folks? I'm not expecting to receive any credible responses to either question. Let me hear from you. That's how I see it. I hope you leave your comments in general in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.